welcome to the Scala UA conference. Uh, I hope we can start. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Krzysiek from Virtuslab, and today I will have the presentation about the Slick and about the Unicorn. So this presentation will be divided into two parts. Uh, first will be more about the Slick itself, and then we will be talking more about the structuring uh, our application with the Slick library with the little help of unicorns. So everything is online, we can take the slides. So what is Sleek? And I would like to give you some kind of introduction here. And I think that the best introduction will be actually to answer the question what Sleek isn't. And Sleek is not an RM because uh, many people are coming to the Sleek board from the RM uh, world and they are somehow expecting that in Slick they will find some objects and connection between the, the objects with some kind of collections inside and that is totally not the case and there is a reason for that because when we, we look at it from the historical point of view the ORM concept is quite uh, old and uh, there's a few things that uh, really don't work the, there that well and we have a lot of different problems uh, when we are mapping of the relational databases with our objects and I think that these problems can be uh, sum up to these two statements so first the false promise uh, we are expecting that we will be working only on objects and we will have all the connections and coding uh, inside the objects they will mimic somehow our relations and things like that and it seems that it's not working that well there are a lot of problems even with simple sometimes with a simple mapping and the second thing is a leaky abstraction uh, so somehow with, for example, lazy collections, we need to be aware of uh, things like session, session scope, just to not run, not get some uh, field, some collections that uh, are, will, be, uh, will be computing and will be computing out of our session scope that will, and we will get this runtime exception here. So and the people who are chatting, rambling about these problems for a quite long time now. Uh, this, yeah, this post uh, is actually from 2006, so it's like uh, 10 years ago. And that's why Slick is trying to take somehow different approach to this problem. So it's, it's so-called functional relation, map, uh, relation mapping and basically what it does is that uh, Sleek is trying to expose database collections, database tuples uh, through the API collection uh, the API that we know for example from the Scala world so we basically are operating on some collections and uh, inside this collection we have these tuples from the database so it's very straightforward and of course, we have the type safety as it is a slick, it is a Scala, and it is, after all, type safe company. And a little bit about uh, being reactive. So, is slick uh, really reactive? We can say that because um, we have this uh, pure API and very clever API that we will see in the moment and Slick is trying to approach the things in the reactive way. But is it really? I would say rather no, because under the hood, the Slick is still dependent on the JTBC uh, driver. That is, uh, the, this JTBC driver is inherently blocking. Uh, it's inherently blocking anyway, so yeah, what's the point? The point is that 
uh, when we approach this problem in the correct way and we will try to deal with it in the correct way, uh, we can end up like having, for example, only the 10 threads for all our operations on the database. So this kind of equation was actually taken from the Postgres documentation and it seems to be that DB pool collections, actually number, number of connections that we need to the database is like core count multiplied by two and plus effective spin to count, so is the number of the disk. And so we can have like 10 connections, so 10 blo blocking threads, actually, that can handle like 10,000 clients. And uh, actually, when we are using the uh, connection pool, we would like to have this connection pool like, um, bigger than our uh, threads number, because yeah, when we are blocking, we can use uh, those additional uh, connection uh, connections to the database to do some other operations. More details we can find in this uh, documentation from this Slick uh, page. Okay, so what about the Slick? So if you want to remember only one thing from this presentation, is I will say so monadic trio. It's basically what we feel when we are uh, when we are operating with the Slick library. So we have the query that is our description to the database SQL operations. We have the DBIO that is our actual action that will be fired, and we have the future. So the future and uh, the future is a result of our operations. Well, no, for everybody. And to start, we will start with the tables. We need to have the things like somehow the, the description of the database. So we have this table model, the table model. We have our row representation, so the representation we will be using in this color word. And we have this table query that is using this description of the database to produce our row representations. And how it looks like in the code, uh, we have our case class because case classes in Scala are the convenient way, mostly to uh, like map some database ta database tables. Uh, we have uh, the definition description of our tables, so we have this columns name and the ID, and we have the default projection that is simply as telling us how to map those uh, tuples to our case class object. And we have this table query, that is our starting point for uh, building the queries. And just to give you the whole pictures and all the parts of it, uh, so we have the universe table, that is a query here. We are filtering this um, by name. Uh, we will get from here the query. Then we are calling the result. So we obtain the DBIO, so the action, and it is not fired yet. We need to run this dbrun method, and then we will get the result from our operations. Okay, so here is the example what we can do. For example, with this uh, with this future results, now we can just like usually do something on this Scala future. So first thing, we will be going from the bottom to the top. We have the query. Uh, query is a type that is, is, uh, is parameterized by uh, this M mixed type, unpacked type, and collection type. Collection type is quite obvious. What about those others two? It's also quite simple. Like, this table model is our mixed type. This row representation is our unpacked type, and the table query. So here we have once again our unpacked type, so our row representation, mixed type, our description of the database, and uh, of course this, the third parameter was, for example, the collections of the sequence in case when we are, for example, filtering something. 
quiz this big it. So this quiz must be somehow translated to the database, to the SQL operations. So when, for example, we have the student table, it, it is uh, in fact the select all, so select all fields from our student table. It's simple like that. And this form and this form is uh, identical. Uh, this form does not make sense in this place, but we will see in a moment that it will be useful. Student, another example, student table, mapping the name, so we only want to this name field. And we see that it's a simple projection. We are taking only the name from the student. More advanced example, so we are doing a filter node, so it will be on the database probably something like where not. We have this additional uh, conditions here, so the student name Tom, student surname start with S and I, and we have this, so this is our applicative form, and we have this our mon monotic form here. These two are I identical, so is they are translated to the identical SQL uh, query, and we have it. Select every field from student, where not, and our conditions. Another example, non-empty. We are using filtering non-empty, so it will be not null on the database level. We have sort by, order by, and the distinct. And we can see that it's, it, the result is as we would expect it. Another example is um, collections. Uh, it's uh, taking and dropping. And uh, this is this uh, behaves exactly as uh, the collections are behaving in the scar. Uh, so you write taking three, dropping two, but it is uh, translated somehow different to the data to the database. Uh, and but the result is also as we expected on the uh, collection level from the scala. Joins uh, two forms of joins: this monadic and applicative joins. Uh, just to introduce, we have this uh, this table that is a junction table between uh, different and important things. Uh, thing here is that we have mapped the f foreign keys here. Uh, so we have uh, foreign foreign key segment student, and we reference student table. We can reference the curse, curse table. We have semester table. Uh, it's a simple description on the foreign key, and we can use this foreign key uh, to join these tables. So uh, here in the monadic form, we are joining, we are taking a segment from the students' course and segment table, and then we are joining with the course with the students, and we can return uh, the table from it. Also, the same, and it. It's, it is a little bit tricky, but this applicative form is more like we feel in the SQL world. So we are simply joining on some field, joining on the other fields, and uh, we are obtaining this first tuple from the first uh, join, and then we are joining with the student. There is our result. We can map over it and produce the same result. More, compli no more complicated joins. Uh, so as we see here, the thing is that we are joining with the student table. So we have this first table, segment and student. Then we are joining with the course table. We have here the segment and the students from the first query. Then we have this additional course. And also we have the join. And so it's, the, it's another join with the semester table. And yeah, it's not quite readable, and but it produced the right result. Still, we can do better using this monadic approach, and it is exactly the same query, and it will produce exactly the same result, but it's more readable, and we can simply return from here this uh, tuple. So as we have seen, uh, before, sometimes one form is more elegant than the other, and 
if we should just choose what we feel that will fit our our needs in some places. So another thing is outer joints. Outer joints we simply can change this join and now we have the join left and we are joining on some field, uh, filtering. The important difference here is that the student is actually an option from the student. Uh, it's because it can have the result or, or we can have this field without the result, so it's a simple null. And it will be translated to this left outer join. Uh, the sad thing here is that we, for now, don't have the monotic form of this join left. So when we are using the outer joins, we cannot always we have to always use this applicative joins because there is no API for that. As we seen before, here this this will be translated to actually not to the joins but to the but to this where statements. And there is no place for outer joins here. They are planning to, to do this in the future, but yeah, we will see. Okay, so, deletes. Deletes and updates are uh, really simple. So we are simply uh, querying for the reason that we are interested in, and then we are calling this uh, method delete, and it will produce the right result. Same goes for, for the updates and we are searching for for entities that we want to update, then we are mapping because we want to update concrete field, for example, here, and we are finding this uh, update uh, in the name, and uh, the result is as expected. We have the update, set name, we're not, with this question mark because this uh, will be replaced with our actual value. Now the parts about the uh, DBIO. So we have this DBIO action, and this part matrice for three types. First is type of result. That this is quite obvious. We have the streaming or not streaming because uh, Slick in version three is supporting the reactive streams, and we have also the uh, type what kind of effect this action will have. It's quite interesting, but first. Yeah, it's quite interesting, and we have this four different uh, effects here. So we have the read effects, where we are simply selecting something from the database. We have the write effects, so delete, update, insert. Schema effect, that is for uh, DDL operations, and transactional, and that uh, is indicating that this operation have to be you know, uh, fired with the within the transaction. And a simple alias, when we are operating on sleep, in, mo sleep in most cases we are using this DBIO. That is a DBIO action from type R, R and with no stream, and all effects are possible. Interesting part about this effect is that, for example, we can create the method that will take only the actions that are actually, for example, only reading something from the database, so they are not modifying the database. It can be important, for example, when we are implementing the concept of the secure res, and we want to be sure that our code is not modifying the database. So this works, and this won't even compile. Another examples of this effect. Uh, so here is our result. So the simple read, write when we are inserting, write with effect transactional when we are doing something tra transactionally. And, for example, operation on the DB, uh, so the creating the new table. Streaming. Streaming is very simple. Instead of using this DB run, we can do DB stream and select something from the, for example, student table. Then we can put it into, for example, Afka streams and do some usual operation on this. On this. So it's really well integrated with this reactive concept. Composition and transactions. So to do something in transaction I, we simply uh, hit this method transaction I. So we have a few inserts here. We are doing the transaction I. Okay, but how do we combine the DB operations? And DBIO is a monad. So we can simply 
flat map over it. Yeah, to, to get the results and do something with that and to get, do the second operation and yeah, that's exactly the code. First insert to the DBI with the value, we can just take it and at the end we can do this transaction I. Okay, we have also the operations like for example future sequence, the same is the DBIO sequence, so we have the sequence of the DBIO and we want to have only one DBIO from the sequence. So we simply translate it. We can have uh, additional, additional operations like uh, here we are for each student uh, are we are finding another DBIO operations and yeah we can connect it and return the courses from here. Uh, combine operations uh, we can, for example, have this method that, that will execute every DBIO action inside uh, the transaction uh, and it will uh, return the type that is int because, uh, yeah, it should be not int, it's uh, exactly t here should be, that's my mistake. No stream because we are not streaming and effect all with effect transaction i because of this transaction i. But when we have more advanced example, I mean, for example, for example, want to delete run this uh, to delete action transaction I, the first one and the second one, but we don't care about this further delete. We can also do this that way, and the result of this DBIO will be effect write with transactional. It is for this first part, and with effect write without this transactional for the second operation. So based on this type, SIG is able, uh, SIG is able to reason uh, what actually, how he should uh, fire those uh, DBIO actions. So it's a little bit tricky, but nice. And uh, this summary for this first first part, part of the presentation. Uh, so SIG is not an ORM. And we should not try to do things like we are doing in an ORM world. Future DBIO and query, the, the, these are the most important parts of the SIG library. We should remember about the DBIO composition, that we can compose this different DBIO in, in different uh, ways. And also we should think in terms of a collection API, so whenever we want to do something interesting on our database, we are trying to uh, think in terms of connection to this on these collections. Important change in three two that can be a game changer here is that uh, some of the drivers were actually not supported uh, and was were only supported in the commercial with the commercial license. Now they are also uh, open source and resources uh, from this first part of the presentation. And now the second part, when we actually will be trying to do something useful with the uh, SIG and build the, uh, build the actual application. Uh, so first, uh, the Unicorn is uh, the library written in Virtus Lab, just to, uh, just this uh, library brings to this SIG world some useful features. And this uh, part of presentation will be will first. I will first cover the unicorn features. There, then I will try to pick one architecture and uh, show you how can we uh, structure our application using Sleek because it can be somehow tricky. So first, the unicorns matching and the problem. We have the uh, join problem. So we somehow mess up with the IDs because these IDs are the log simply and we are joining the user table uh, with the games table based on the place ID that is wrong and the problem is that we don't have the information about it in compile time so what can we do about it we can introduce so called type safe IDs so this is a simple case class for the user ID and we can extend the base ID from the unicorn library and uh, then we can put this user ID inside our uh, raw representation and we can extend with with ID. Uh, it's a simple trait uh, that will be useful for building other features I will show in a minute. 
And we have the uh, IT table, so it's a simple extension over the sleek uh, default table. Uh, the only difference is that we are putting here our user ID, and rest remain the same, and we have the stable query as always. Then again, the same problem, we are trying to join on the wrong IDs, and now we will get the uh, Compilation error it should be green. Oh, it is, but okay. Uh, so we have this uh, compilation error, and that's okay, and that's exactly what we want to see. Now, another feature from the uh, Unicorn Library is base ID repository. So it's a very generic database access object. Uh, we simply extend this uh, base ID repository, putting user ID, user row representation, and user stable. And then we will get for, for free some useful operation like find by ID, find extend existing by ID. And uh, also worth to mention that another operation that we want to uh, that we want to have, we should put also inside this users and database access object just to just to encapsulate on all operations in one place. The junction table another feature from the unicorn library uh, because as I uh, show you before. Uh, that is not Slick is not trying to hide anything from uh, from us, so we are we have to deal with everything on our own. And uh, but we can speed up a little bit our developing and use this junction table, and we'll get for free some methods like find by game ID or find all or delete or and things like that. And okay, that uh, that is all for from the unicorn. Library and now more about the structuring our application. Uh, so we have this traditional uh, approach to our to building our application. So we have presentation layer, application layer, domain layer, and infrastructure layer. The problem is that uh, in within this uh, architecture, the domain layer is depend the depends on infrastructure layer. And it's somehow wrong because when we are changing something in our infrastructure, and it can happen. We also have to change something in our domain layer, and our business logic should, should be independent. And there's another approach to this problem, uh, quite uh, quite important nowadays, especially with this uh, DDD concept, that we are using this onion architecture. We still have layers, like instance infrastructure, API, domain, and co. Uh, but inside this infrastructure is the more, most outside layer and it contains also our UI and tests. So basically it's everything that is, uh, that is communicating with the external world. We have the API that is a gateway to our, to our application. And we have the domain uh, and the core. The core is uh, the uh, standard language features like uh, lists or sequence or even the actors from the ACA. And the important thing is that internal layers don't know anything about the uh, outer layers. So the domain don't know anything about the infrastructure. But the domain can talk to the infrastructure through the domain interfaces that will be implemented uh, by this infrastructure, uh, infrastructure layer. So it's kind of the inversion of control on the, uh, on the, architecture, layer, on the architecture level. So I will be talking mainly about these two layers, infrastructure and the domain. I will skip this API as the presentation is about this week. So inside the infrastructure layer, we have this table representation, row representation, the base component that is aggregating those two. We have the rep repository implementation uh, that uh, aggregates the database access object and implements the rep repository interface. And of course, we have the domain service that, are, that contains our pure business logic and is dependent only on this repository interface. So first element I would like to see and show you is a base component. And base components is a simple trait that contains the unicorn object, so our database uh, with the driver, with the actual implementation of the driver, our user's table, so the description, 
the query and the user's database access object. And this is quite important here because we are requiring on runtime that our unicorn will be a concrete of a concrete implementation of this unicorn. Why is it important? Because when we can in our configuration uh, have for has for example a Postgres configuration and then we can switch those configuration to for example H2 database and all this code will now produce different query. So we will have different queries on the for the Postgres and different queries for the H2. And uh, yeah, so it's important for example for testing where we can simply switch our databases. Then we can extend of course other components just for example to reference so to have this uh, foreign key and uh, by this foreign key we can re reference the user's table so for example we have this org organizer ID which is a, a user. Second element from this uh, infrastructure is repository implementation. So we have this JDBC uh, implementation. We are requiring that our uh, unicorn uh, will be provided by, by the choose. And we have this user space repository component. Uh, with user repository, that is our inter interface, domain interface. And some this is for the uh, operation with the DBIO. Uh, we have our user database access object and our implementation. So we are using this database object to obtain uh, the concrete user. Two things that are important thing, uh, here is that first, we are not returning anything that is connected to the infrastructure because we are, we are mapping to this uh, user object, that is the domain object, and we are returning from there, the from here only the user. Also, we are not returning from here the future, so we are not firing here the uh, actual operation. Why? Because uh, when we when we return from here the DBIO, we can then, for example, uh, like join different uh, objects and find different objects across different uh, repositories and for example also call them transactionally. If we would, we would uh, return from here the future, we are not able to um, make this thing happen transactionally. It's important and also I'm using here this option T from the uh, CATS library. Why? Because we have this find by ID that will return the DBIO from option from user and operating on this uh, value inside this option is quite tricky, so it's good to use the CAS library in such places. So here was more advanced example of uh, creating the domain object. So inside the game we are putting the organizer, we are putting the place. And the transactions, yeah, we can do them, so we, we have this delete game on the game repository and this, those two deletes we can uh, join and then call transactionally. And uh, repository interface. And there is a one trick here. So from domain perspective, there, it is not important if you are returning here the DBIO or future or for example task from the Scalazi uh, we only care that we will have some kind of box here and inside this box we will uh, have our, our uh, value, so our user. And that's enough. And actual implementation of our business logic. We will try to uh, compute the root mean square of our pliers uh, per game. So first thing is that here we can we have to actually require that its simple box is not that simple and is actually the monad. Why? Because we want to do something useful with this value that is inside this f type. So uh, without it uh, we, or with it we, we can just do this for comprehension, take this value this value from here, 
and apply some computation on it. And we also requiring here to have this game as a repository, of course, it can be injected on the right time. There's a presentation about this concept, you can follow. And testing our domain service, because we are, we've defined this uh, generic interface, domain interface, so when we are testing our, our code and our business logic, we actually can mock our repository with the, with the uh, identity inside. So we are using this feature from this uh, CATS library. We are putting here the identity. So we can simply return the sequence of, of values. We don't have to deal on our tests with the futures or with the DBIO. We can simply return the sequence. Uh, then, so we are returning it, it here. Then we can fire some computations and simply check the value. So it should be two, not the future from two or the DBIO from two. So yeah, just to stress the point that using the CAS library, we can be benefits, benefit from it. And it's important when we are dealing with the monads to have the right tool to do so. And how we, we can glue together everything? I'm skipping here the API layer and I'm putting uh, everything inside the controller. And it's also the right way to do because, as I said before, the actual controllers are our infrastructure layer also. Uh, so we can inject here the unicorn with our database, database driver and we ha can inject the statistic service that will be dependent on the DBIO. So we are requiring that our uh, implementation of our uh, domain services will contain this uh, DBIO. And then we simply can uh, execute our actions. So we are taking this average number of players per game and this service now will be returning DBIO from something, from the int here. And we can run this on our DB, then map to to the JSON, a uh, little bit, a uh, few, few things in choose, so to implement, uh, first is our unicorn with this type long, and second thing, so we are binding game users repository from the DBIO to our actual implementation, JDBC implementation of this repository, and things just works. So, to recap, general tricks and tips, so, Make good use of the DBIO monad. Uh, don't escape the DBIO uh, too quickly. And be familiar with CATS or scala libraries, like the API of the SDIC is full of monads, and without the right tool, it can, it can be a pain to uh, deal with these values inside these boxes. Uh, do not couple your domain with DBIO future. So we can just in the domain uh, say that uh, it contains some f value and this f is our box for our uh, actual value and a separate infrastructure from domain chain on your architecture idea especially that is quite popular now because of this uh, domain driven design. Yeah, uh, that's all. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, here we have also the resources, and I highly recommend this book. This book as uh, it uh, have very nice practical examples for every important I think uh, library in uh, Scala world. Uh, this uh, cool presentations on the London Scala. Uh, meetup about this concept of not coupling the domain with the uh, with our implementation of our DBIO, and here is about the you know, architecture. Thing. I got one question, like from the end part of the presentation. Uh, you mentioned that you hide the, the implementation details in the monad, but later on you have to somehow invoke that DBIO or future. So how is this done in this onion shape? I mean, what 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 know what the monad is inside and how is it evaluated? Okay, so at some point we have to 
uh, have like concrete implementation of this uh, of this monad, and uh, we can do this on this uh, infrastructure layer. I was doing uh, it right here, so uh, I'm binding this uh, to the implementation to the DBIO implementation. So here you can have another implementation for this game users repository. So it can be from the future, for example, and you just uh, uh, switch those with uh, this with this future value, and then everything inside, uh, and then the service is returning the future. Yeah, the problem is that you have to change this part of code because now we have the future here not the uh, TBIO. Yeah, but it's not bad because the, this is the infrastructure layer. So still, if you are, for example, replacing your data database, so instead of having the database and returning the TBIO, you will have to deal with the futures because, for example, you have the actor systems. Uh, instead of that, uh, you will uh, still have to deal with these uh, futures, not the TBIOs, and, but your domain remains the same. So it's important that when you get this, uh, yeah, here we have this domain implementation. The domain does not know anything about the futures. The other problem here is that you like cannot couple two different monads. Because when you are flat mapping, you only can flat map on the same type. So if you are uh, like replacing uh, the one service, it's not so easy to just go f f and have one service implemented like with the database, so returning the DBIO, and second one with the futures. You will have to have some other object on this uh, APA layer, for example, and just escape from the f f uh, DBIO, so make this the future and flat map. Escape from the future. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's all. I have some other slides also, but you can uh, see them on this on um, our, our on my page. So thank you very much. Okay, that's a question. Sorry. Yes, uh, I've seen there is a variable uh, tag when we introduce table class, uh, but uh, we don't use it. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, what can we do with this. Uh, we don't use it. What? What uh, part of? Uh, variable tag. We uh, introduce an, in constructor when we uh, in table class. Which? Which? Oh, okay. Okay, I see. So uh, you know, I know what you are talking about. Is uh, the sleek internals, and uh, we are not using it, but it is required by sleek. It can uh, like uh, make some confusion. But uh, yeah, basically they, they was, were, weren't able to implement it without this tag. So uh, we are talking about, uh, I think it can be article. Uh, so yeah, uh, this tag here. Yes. Yes, so it is uh, required by the uh, uh, C library. I, it was some kind of tricky and the people, I, I was uh, just, was looking at this question on the Stack Overflow and the answer was that yeah, it's required by the uh, Sleek library and we can just put it here and forget about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for such comprehensive presentation. Uh, so can you please, in a few words, describe what is uh, this def and uh, like default projection? Method. Yeah. So and why it's it takes two parameters. Okay, maybe we will try to do this. Uh, I don't have a projection here. I will try to find the table with actual projection. Oh, uh -huh. it's always projection here. Okay, here uh -huh. we will say that. Uh, so those are the simple definitions of, of our uh, of our actual table from the database and this 
we are overriding, so this is something inside the uh, this unicorn, uh, this uh, Snig library, and then uh, this require for us this method to return a function that is able to translate from the tuple. So we are taking our fields: email, first name, last name. Uh, and our ID is uh, inside because we are using this uh, ID table from the uh, unicorn and we are writing the prescription how can Sleek actually map this uh, tuple to our row representation, so to our user row, uh, user row. and here's the method tuple that is taking this uh, this tuple and producing the user row and it's an apply so it's going like from the user row we can just return uh, the sum from the uh, tuple and it knows how to map between it and it's quite important because uh, as we can see we can have a, a few different projections for the same database table so we can take these users and just map some fields only we can take and and then again take these users and map the other fields or uh, yeah you know it's not like in the hibernate when we have this one entity and we were trying to put everything there so it's quite useful here and it's not complicated it's, and here is the, like the implicit from the driver okay so thank you very much But I would just say that uh, they should definitely try uh, the new things that are, that are approaching this car, the new libraries. Just to watch, we have a lot of great conferences, so we can watch also the uh, conference materials, and uh, everybody can get something uh, for him. And Scala community is like very academical one, so it's a great that. We are still learning. We are not like staying in one place, but we are trying to get to know with the new framework. So I would say that try to always discover, try to uh, try to use libraries and see what are the good parts of it and what are the bad parts of these libraries. Because and after that you can try to like introduce it also in your company, but not rush but try to look at it and evaluate it a little bit try to like, listen what others uh, want to say and what others that are experienced in this technology want to say to you then maybe apply it to the production so.